You know, it seems like when the worst arrives, it demands our best. And the abilities of every discipline present in this room today to come together, working together, being here with the weather experts, the first responders, the local leaders, the private sector partners, the military forces, the volunteers, folks who devote their time and effort to protecting our citizens. It is a, it's a great honor for me. It's a distinct privilege to be in your presence. I'm encouraged because of the experience <clears throat> that's represented in this conference and, and that's being shared so that uh, everyone can be better. I'm encouraged because the information exchange will give us a better understanding of the challenges that we face and yield valuable improvements in our strategy. Mother Nature didn't take it easy on Texas in 2008. It's the most, um, most expensive storm season in our state's history. Texas responded to three hurricanes, major tropical storm, all in less than two months. Yeah, if that wasn't enough, we had a potentially catastrophic uh, event in, in the border town of Presidio that was going on at the very same time that Hurricane Ike was hitting the Gulf Coast. And, you know, there's nothing like two major emergencies 700 miles apart to kind of test your system. Um, and ours worked just fine. And it illustrated the strength of our approach here in Texas. We start looking to the local officials. Uh, nobody knows their areas better than the local folks. Uh, getting them the resources that they need when they need them. When you think of a county judge, you might picture, you know, somebody in a robe with a gavel, but more often I think about them being uh, somebody with a, a khaki shirt and blue jeans and boots on uh, at an emergency operations center. Uh, they do a great job. In addition to local control for local challenges, the other hallmark of our approach in Texas is proactivity. Uh, in a word, as soon as we get a bead on where this storm is going to come ashore, we start moving people out of the way. We start activating our statewide shelter system. And our philosophy is pretty simple. A storm can't hurt people that aren't there because the lives are really the bottom line, saving those lives, putting people out of harm's way. Hurricane Ike didn't make us question our strategy for one second, but it sure did a quite an interesting dance before it ever got to shore. You know, as it approached Texas, those models indicated just a constantly shifting landing zone from Beaumont to Brownsville and all the way back. So <clears throat> while it was doing a little dance, we were doing a little dance. Uh, we shifted our pre-staged resources multiple times, moving emergency response personnel, vehicles, as well as the mass care materials where they were needed. As Hurricane Ike came ashore, that storm surge caused massive flooding, uh, destroyed a lot of buildings, trapped a lot of people, uh, trapped a lot of people who ignored the warnings to get out. Um, you know, I'm all about the independent Texas spirit, um, but we sure expended a lot of resources and our first responders' lives were put in jeopardy to move 3,500 people to safety because they didn't listen to the warnings. You know, they were made up of Texas Task Force One, the Texas Military Forces, Texas Task Force Two, had our parks and wildlife folks, had the mass care teams in there, and those teams went the extra mile. All in all, there were more than 1,500 rescue personnel using 549 vehicles, 63 aircraft, 253 boats, and I am told that it was the largest search and rescue operation in our state's history. At the same time, those brave men and women were saving lives. Our electrical crews were gearing up to get power back to some 2.8 million Texans who had lost power. Those electrical crews were just part of an overall storm response that succeeded because the local leaders had the resources that they need to execute their plans and their decisions at the point of impact. Another key 
contribution to our success comes from our private sector partners. That's our fuel partners, our retail and, and uh, transportation industries. They were completely integrated into our plan and our, or I should say, our planning and our response. And based on our experiences with Hurricane Katrina and Rita, we opened the doors to the State Operations Center. We invited in the experts, folks with the resources and the know-how to get things done and to get things to certain places at the right time. You know, as soon as that barometer starts to fall, the state of Texas fuel team starts to work getting fuel where it's needed, mostly to the impact zone and along the ec evacuation routes so our citizens can gas up and go. Dealing with demand that spiked more than 400 percent at times, the fuel team did a fabulous job of dealing with, I think, one of the, the tougher issues uh, that we face as a state. On the commodity side, we partnered with companies uh, like Walmart, Lowe's, HEB, Home Depot, and uh, you know, along with Brookshire and Brookshire Brothers, those, those grocery partners, if you will. And they, you know, they move product from state line to state line every day. And I, I happen to think there's not any better people that know how to move things and get them to the right place than those folks that do it every day in the private sector. So, uh, you know, as, as, as these storms approach and we encourage people to uh, leave the impact area, uh, evacuees often interact with our mass care team that's also coordinated by our state operations center. Uh, the mass care team coordinates our volunteer organizations that provide the compassionate care to evacuees who are scared, they're tired, they're unsure about what the future holds for them. The point-to-point -point shelter network that we developed after Hurricane Rita matches coastal communities with inland communities to coordinate and plan for evacuations. It cuts down on surprises. It provides significant support. You know, not everybody can get out on their own. We realize that too. And so we made available some 1,500, or excuse me, 1,300 buses uh, during Ike to give people the opportunity to get out of harm's way that did not have a, a way um, independently to move. Every person who gets onto one of our vehicles is tracked from point to point with an encoded wristband. So we know the location of each person in the state that's in our care during an event. We also track those critical care, special needs patients with the GPS device uh, in real time so that the folks get to where they need to be and we know exactly where they are in real time. You know, during Ike, Texas evacuated over 12,500 special needs residents, and we sheltered more than 42,000 evacuees in our statewide network. And, and with shelters all over the state, we, we had some coastal folks that ended up in El Paso. Now, if you want to just put that in perspective, that's like going from here to Jacksonville, Florida. That's the distance we're talking about. Um, I would say that's Texas size. You, know, you might wonder if, you know, I know from time to time somebody asks, you know, was it worth it? Was it worth the effort? Was it worth the expense? Folks in this room can give them the answer. Talk to someone who's looked into the eyes of a terrified citizen as people have plucked them from the roof of a, of a building. Uh, talk to one of those shelter workers who's re reunited a, uh, an evacuee with their families. Talk with a church member who's given somebody a first meal that they've had in 48, 72 hours. Ask them if it's worth it. They'll tell you that lives were saved and that hope was restored when all else was lost. And for me, that's worth it. 
207 days has passed since Hurricane Ike made landfall. And I was in Galveston last week. People are still trying to put their lives back together. I asked a commission for, I uh, put together a commission for disaster recovery and renewal. And they've been working with the local and the state and the federal partners to help these communities recover and return to normal as fast as they can. Um, we still got a lot of work to do, but I'm not going to relent. I know you're not going to relent until we have this renewal complete. 